Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're diving into a massive shakeup in the world of IT, what's being called the VMware Exodus. We're going to look at how one company's business strategy after a huge acquisition basically triggered a rebellion among its most loyal users, forcing an entire industry to rethink its very foundations. You know, it all kind of started with this simple, powerful phrase. Across forums, Slack channels, you name it, countless IT pros, I mean, people who literally built their careers on VMware, were all of a sudden just saying, we're done. And look, this wasn't some quiet, orderly migration. This, this was a reckoning. For decades, let's be honest, VMware was the undisputed king of virtualization. It was the rock-solid foundation for the enterprise, the name you put on your resume to be taken seriously. So what on earth happened? What could possibly make so many diehard fans just get up and abandon the platform they championed for years? So first up, let's talk about the end of an era. We're going to look at how the king of virtualization suddenly found its kingdom in open revolt. And this whole revolt, you can trace it right back to the fallout from Broadcom's acquisition of VMware. This is where the first domino started to fall. The main catalyst, the thing that really kicked it all off, was Broadcom discontinuing a product called VMware vSphere Foundation, or VVF. For a huge number of customers, VVF was, well, it was the sweet spot. It had all the core features they actually needed, and it was at a price that made sense. And then, poof, it was just gone. And the replacement they were offering? It was not a simple upgrade. Customers were getting pushed towards something called VMware Cloud Foundation, or VCF which is a full-on private cloud stack. The problem was, it was bundled with all these complex, expensive tools for networking and automation that, frankly, most of the old VVF users just didn't need or want to pay for. Yeah, this shift came with a pretty brutal reality check. For people trying to get features similar to what they already had, the cost just skyrocketed. I mean, we're talking about the price multiplying by up to four times, almost overnight. As one admin put it, I was ready to pay for VVF, but to drop the SQ and 4X the price, I'm gone. And this question from a veteran user just captures that disconnect perfectly. The customer base really felt like they were being strong-armed into buying this way more expensive package filled with features they were probably never, ever going to use. But you see, this wasn't just a budget problem. The fallout created what you could call a forced evolution. It was a career-defining moment for thousands of experts who now had a pretty stark choice, adapt or get left behind. So this kicked off a whole year of frantic upskilling. You had professionals with a decade of deep, specialized VMware knowledge who were suddenly scrambling to learn completely new platforms like Proxmox and Hyper-V just to keep their infrastructure running and, you know, stay relevant in their own fields. And you know, while that learning curve was definitely steep, a lot of them discovered a silver lining. The fundamental concepts of virtualization, the stuff they'd mastered over all those years, well, that's universal. The real challenge wasn't relearning their craft, it was just learning a new syntax for a different tool. Okay, so this whole search for alternatives created a massive opening in the market. New contenders started emerging from the shadows, ready to challenge VMware's long-held throne. And maybe the most surprising hero in this whole story is Proxmox. I mean, for years, this thing was mostly seen as a solution for home labs and hobbyists, but suddenly, this open-source platform found itself being deployed in serious, enterprise-level production environments. Talk about an underdog story. So how does it actually stack up? Well, there's a key trade-off here. Proxmox can't really match VMware's legendary Distributed Resource Scheduler, or DRS, which is that magic feature that automatically balances workloads. For some huge enterprises, that's a deal-breaker for sure. But for a whole lot of others, the open source cost model, super fast migrations, and direct support were more than enough to win them over. And speaking of support, listen to this. This quote is about the Proxmox support experience. A user said they got a critical support ticket completely resolved in under an hour without having to fight their way through multiple tiers of offshore reps. I mean, for anyone who's ever spent hours on a support line, you know that kind of responsiveness is an absolute game changer. Now, Proxmox wasn't the only option. Microsoft's Hyper-V also got a serious second look. For companies already deep in the Microsoft ecosystem, it was the good enough alternative, often already included with existing licenses. That said, it's known for its own set of headaches, especially when it comes to patching and just how clunky the management tools can be. This whole crisis also fueled a really fascinating trend. 
the rise of the home lab as a serious proving ground for enterprise tech. Engineers started testing and vetting these new platforms at home, not just for fun anymore, but for actual real-world deployments. But not everyone's sold on this idea. There's a healthy dose of skepticism out there, captured perfectly by this quote. The argument is that what works in a souped-up computer in your basement might not be ready for the intense demands and scale of a real business. And honestly, it's a debate that's still raging. So with this mass migration now underway, what comes next? Does this actually spell the end for VMware? Let's try and look at the bigger picture. Okay, let's be super clear here. VMware's technology is still elite. vSphere is battle-tested like nothing else, and DRS is still considered straight-up magic by a lot of admins. For really complex environments with deep hooks into tools like Veeam or Zerto for backup and disaster recovery, ripping it all out just isn't a realistic option. Ultimately, this whole exodus isn't really about the technology. It's about the business model. The core problem isn't performance. It's the wild pricing and the disappearing licenses that have made any kind of long-term planning a nightmare. It really seems to be part of Broadcom's playbook. Focus on your absolute top spending customers and kind of let everyone else figure it out for themselves. And this, this just hits the nail on the head. This quote really gets to the heart of the crisis. In some cases, Broadcom's strategy has made it literally impossible for willing, loyal customers to keep doing business with them. They just can't buy the products they need anymore, even if they wanted to. So is this just another cycle in the tech world? Some industry veterans see it that way. You know, just another pivot, like the old shifts away from Novell or Lotus Notes. But the sheer scale and the speed of this exodus it kind of suggests that maybe, just maybe, this time is different. Well, while the future isn't written in stone, one thing is absolutely certain. The era of having a single undisputed king in virtualization is over. This wasn't just a shift in software. It was a shift in power, right back to the users. And the real question now is, which of the tech giants are actually listening? And who might be next? <laughs>